It all began on February 16, 2005, in a house at Palmas in the Mbokayati de Nembi neighborhood. Police were digging in the area to find the house where a video of the supposed kidnapping rehearsal was made. At first, they found nothing but an abandoned house. However, they confirmed it was the location where the short video was filmed. But there was more, a recently poured cement floor that seemed to be hollow. When they broke through the concrete, a nasty smell leaked out. They couldn't see anything at first, but as they made the hole bigger, they found a decomposing body, which was sadly identified as a woman. Everyone wondered if it was Cecilia Cubas, a young woman who had been kidnapped just days before. Unfortunately, it was her. This discovery troubled the whole nation and left a mark on Paraguay's history. Raul Cubas was born on August 23, 1943, in Asuncion, Paraguay. He stepped into politics, joined the National Republican Association, and served as the Minister of Finance under President Juan Carlos from 1993 until he resigned in 1996 due to disagreements. By 1998, Raul was running for vice president with the same party. Initially, he was paired with General Oviedo, but Oviedo had to step down because of legal issues and was jailed. So Raul aimed for the presidency, teaming up with the seasoned Luis Maria Argana, who had lost the primary to Oviedo. Despite being an unlikely pair of rivals, they won the election that year. The campaign had to use photo montages for their posters because of their stark differences. Argana, confident of victory, boycotted his own list leading Cubas to fill his cabinet in key positions with his own supporters, excluding the Argania faction from power and its benefits. This exclusion triggered an immediate backlash, pushing the Argana faction to align with the opposition. Just three days into his presidency, Raul freed Oviedo from jail, exploiting a legal loophole, even though it was technically illegal. This move only increased the tension within the party, on March 23, 1999, Argana was ambushed and killed in his car. Oviedo was immediately blamed, but there was no evidence against him. Oddly, the crime scene was littered with grenades, suggesting it was no ordinary crime. The public grew increasingly unhappy with their leaders, leading to massive and violent protests. Some party members accused Raul of pushing the country toward a civil war. In a twist, Argana's supporters forgave some farmers' debts to gain their support against Raul. A large-scale protest, fueled by media support, soon followed, highlighting the deep divisions and turmoil within the country. This protest ended with several deaths, and fingers were pointed at Cuba's as the one to blame. He faced impeachment for mishandling the crisis and using the law to free Oviedo. Choosing to avoid more trouble, he resigned as president and moved to Brazil with his family. In February 2002, the former president returned to Paraguay with his wife and daughter. Right away, he was arrested and charged with corruption and being involved in the murder of Vice President Argana. He was eventually cleared of these charges, but he knew the people still disliked him. He and his family could never live peacefully again. Cecilia Cubas was born in Asuncion, Paraguay on January 14, 1973. She was the daughter of Raul Cubas and Mirta Gusinki. Even after returning to their home country, her family remained quite wealthy. Cecilia managed her father's company. Despite her father no longer being president, the political spotlight remained on them. Cecilia always had to be protected by security guards. Her life was never thought to be at risk until two years after coming back to Paraguay when she was 31. On September 21, 2004, Around 6.45 p.m., Cecilia was driving her car heading home to the Laguna Grande neighborhood after a long day. Her mother was in a separate car, and both were under guard. Mirta's vehicle slightly moved ahead, leaving her daughter behind. 
Near her home, Cecilia turned onto Coronel Machuca Street and was blocked by two vehicles. A blue Volkswagen Santana blocked her way, and a red Ford Escort blocked her from behind. Cecilia was trapped. Two men with military weapons got out of the Ford Escort and shot at her car 26 times, hitting the tires, body, headlights, and windshields. The bodyguards did everything they could to protect Cecilia, even some losing their lives in the process. A third man with a heavy metal hammer smashed the passenger window, opened the door, and pulled Cecilia out. She resisted but was struck and dragged by her hair. They forced her into the blue Santana and sped away, leaving behind her damaged car and the wrecked Ford Escort. All of this happened in just five minutes. One of the surviving bodyguards ran to Raul's house to report the incident. The former president started his own investigation, but it was tough. There were no surveillance cameras on the street where the attack happened, and witnesses couldn't tell which way Cecilia's abductors went. Despite the investigation, no clues were found at the crime scene. The family was left anxiously waiting for any news from Cecilia's kidnappers. Hours later, Diana Sosa, a close friend of Cecilia, got a call from an unknown number. On the other end was a man who confirmed that Cecilia had been kidnapped. He assured them that she was okay for now and that the kidnappers would make contact again. That was all the information the family got until a week later. After a week, the kidnappers sent instructions for Cecilia's family to find proof of life scattered around the city. It was like a grim treasure hunt, with the family having to check strange places like a water tank in a mall bathroom and under public monuments in parks. They found photos of Cecilia holding a newspaper with the current date, showing she was still alive, and there were handwritten letters too. Eventually, the kidnappers reached out via email to make their first ransom demand, asking for $5 million for Cecilia's safe return. The family tried to negotiate, and on November 13th, in a rural area of the Kaguazu department, they paid $300,000. But the kidnappers quickly changed their minds, demanding the original amount again, saying the $300,000 was just a penalty for the delay, and the real negotiation was starting now. Cecilia's family was distraught. Cecilia's father realized things were getting out of hand and went to the authorities and media. The story spread, leading to prayer chains, protests, and vigils as everyone demanded Cecilia's release. The kidnappers kept sending photos of her, showing injuries and dark circles under her eyes. In an email, they taunted the former president, saying they were taking care of his daughter as he had taken care of the country, hinting that they weren't ordinary criminals. The prosecutor's office and security agencies started to investigate which groups were behind the kidnapping. Cecilia's family, with a negotiation specialist, set up a task force office to analyze all incoming information. They kept a detailed record of emails, calls, phone numbers, and messages from the start of the ordeal. Eventually, one kidnapper made a mistake by sending an email from his own account, revealing his name as Osmar Martinez. The police went to his house to question him. He was surprisingly cooperative and even mentioned others were involved. After the incident on the Colombia-Ecuador border, the computer of Raul Reyes, a high-ranking member of the FARC guerrilla group, was found. This computer revealed emails showing communication between Martinez and Rodrigo Granda, who was known as the foreign minister of the FARC. Granda was also in contact with Reyes. Everything lined up. The emails between Granda and Reyes were the same ones Granda used to communicate with Martinez. Their discussions weren't only about Cecilia, they were planning kidnappings, targeting wealthy and influential families. As the investigation intensified, the kidnappers grew angry about the police's involvement, threatening to kill Cecilia as a warning. However, they continued demanding the same ransom, referring to Cecilia as the fruit in their emails. They pressured the family to hurry with the payment, hinting that Cecilia was deteriorating or rotting. On December 22nd of that year, the kidnappers reached out again, not with a photo of Cecilia, but with an email giving the family 48 hours to send $3 million, or they'd never see her again. The former president publicly demanded proof that his daughter was alive 
and expressed willingness to pay the ransom. Meanwhile, the investigators were trying to solve the case independently, but were met with silence from the kidnappers after that night. The investigation continued without new leads in Cecilia's case. After arresting two known criminals, Alcides Oviedo and Carmen Villalba, an important video was found showing a house suspected of being used for kidnappings. This operation was led by prosecutor Sandra Canones, who had been removed from Cecilia's case by then. They had the address and street name of the house. Sandra ordered a move on the location, not knowing what awaited them. They arrived at Palma Street. The house appeared abandoned, but one agent noticed the upper part was well-maintained, prompting them to enter. Inside, they found freshly laid cement that sounded hollow when stepped on. Starting their search for weapons, they expected to find those used by the group who kidnapped a woman in 2001. However, they were in for a shock when they broke the floor and a foul smell emerged, initially thought to be dampness or decomposing rats, but it was much worse. By midnight, as they made the hole larger, they found signs of a decomposing body. Was it Cecilia? Was the first question many asked when a body was found. The media quickly checked the scene, followed by Cecilia's family and the President of the Republic. Cecilia's father recognized her body immediately, but they had to wait for the forensic verdict. An agonizing wait began, ending with the confirmation of the worst. The body was Cecilia Cubas. She had been dead for about 60 days, a fact that brought immense grief not just to her family, but to the entire nation, which had prayed for her safe return, unaware of the horrors she had endured. At the scene, police found various items, including sulfur, ballistic vests, suggesting the house was occupied by Magna Meza and Osvaldo Villalba, members of the organization that kidnapped Cecilia. They led normal lives to avoid suspicion. Cecilia had endured terrible conditions, given only a little water, with multiple cuts on her body and signs of severe beating. The autopsy revealed she had been dead for about 45 days, likely between December 24th and 30. The kidnappers had taped her mouth and sedated her with a sleeping pill, then buried her alive in a pit they dug while she was still unconscious. When Cecilia awoke, she tried to breathe but inhaled sand and was trapped under hundreds of pounds of cement. The perpetrators quickly left the house, pretending to go away for the New Year's celebrations to avoid suspicion, and never returned. It was also discovered that Cecilia was pregnant, a result of being raped by one or more of her captors. The fetus died the night before she did. This heinous act marked Cecilia as the first kidnapped and murdered victim of the Patria Libre Party, later known as the Paraguayan People's Army. How could such a significant operation go unnoticed? Since November 2004, people near the location knew about Cecilia's whereabouts but chose to remain silent. Someone informed the local priest, who then told the mayor of the town. The mayor instructed a commissioner to investigate. On December 11th, he visited the notorious house but got no response. Then he noted the license plate of a white car parked there, and further investigation revealed its suspicious history. On January 14th, Confusion arose when the former owner of the house was contacted by the anti-kidnapping police unit. They were investigating the property's sale, which officially listed an indigenous man as the current owner. The indigenous man, however, was unaware the house was in his name. He had pawned his ID in 1995 for groceries, leading to his identity being used fraudulently to buy the house in late 2003. A similar scheme was used for the vehicles in Cecilia's kidnapping. The Ford Escort was purchased using a fake ID of a market vendor who had reported his ID missing in August 2003. On January 15th, an officer confirmed these details at the police station, but took no further action. A woman living next to the house where Cecilia was held heard strange noises throughout her captivity, but stayed silent, fearing police would not protect her. Many people who might have spoken up in time to save Cecilia never faced trial, though, fortunately, her captors did. Around 20 people linked to the organization were arrested and sentenced to 5 to 35 years in prison for Cecilia's kidnapping. However, the main suspects fled. The family sought justice, but with many of the perpetrators free, no one felt safe. 
Over time, it was revealed that the kidnappers had connections with the Colombian insurgent group, FARC, also a far-left group. Complicity of several police officers in the event was also confirmed. In June 2021, Oscar Benitez's was finally captured and sentenced to 24 years in prison, with an additional 10 years for security measures. On October 19, 2021, Rodrigo Granda was arrested in Mexico City while attending an international political party seminar. Granda, serving as a liaison between FARC leaders during Cecilia's kidnapping, represented a significant link in unraveling the network behind this tragic event. Despite the arrest made, several individuals involved in Cecilia's abduction are currently active members of the Paraguayan People's Army, which is still operational in the northern part of the country, engaging in kidnappings and extortions. They claim to be defending the needy against the powerful elites of Paraguay. In captivity, there are notable figures like former Vice President Oscar Dines, rancher Felix Urbieta, and police officer Edelio Morinigo with Morinigo being held captive for over eight years. On September 9th, 2021, the families of these captives held a press conference to express their frustration over the lack of action from authorities and security agencies. They pointed out that not only have the missing persons not been found, but organized crime in the region has not been eradicated either. That's the end of today's episode of The Crime Storyteller. We've dived deep into the shadows of humanity's darkest deeds. But remember, the truth is often stranger and more chilling than fiction. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss a beat in our exploration of the most bewildering criminal cases. Until next time, this is The Crime Storyteller.